Well, I never thought it'd come down to this, but I guess I'll be making a video on the difference between a vacuum chamber and a pressure pot. And making this guy using those techniques. So, let's do this. It's been about three months since I've made a video and trying to put this one together is, uh, I'm having to knock the rust off of the gears to uh, do what I gotta do. Anyway, you'll hear the terms vacuum chamber and pressure pot thrown around by creators who work with resins and silicones. A vacuum chamber works with a vacuum pump to suck the air out of materials. A pressure pot works with an air compressor to squeeze down the air bubbles to a microscopic level where they're invisible to the naked eye. Depending on what you are wanting to do is which one you would want to use. Nice. Silicones and resins generally come in two parts. You have the actual material and then you have a hardener or a catalyst and you have to mix them together. Well, when you mix, you're introducing air bubbles. It's kind of unavoidable. There are some techniques to try to limit them, but that you could save that for someone else's video. A lot of times you'll get air bubbles like that. And that's what you want to avoid. And using a pressure pot or a vacuum chamber can help alleviate that. Let's continue talking about uh, vacuum chambers and we'll come back to the pressure pot thing in a little bit. Vacuum chamber degasses, but another term that you'll hear is stabilizing. What you end up doing is you take a stabilizing resin and you'll take a piece of material, generally wood, submerge it in it, and it still degasses it, it pulls the air out of the wood, you'll turn off the pump and the stabilizing resin will suck back into the piece of wood. A product I use, Alumalite, is a polyurethane resin and it is incredibly susceptible to moisture. So you want to stabilize wood or whatever, or you will get this result. This is a piece of red oak that was not stabilized, put into the resin, and it bubbled up, and it's got that white kind of haze and film around it. I took another piece of red oak, stabilized it, and then put it in, and you see the difference. The stabilizing resin actually fills in all those gaps Stabilizing resin is not like typical resins. It's actually a heat cured resin. You have to have a little oven, like a little toaster oven or whatever, and you can put the material in there and it will actually, it'll bake it and cure it. Nice. I've got to do a little side note slash rant for just a second. If you want to stabilize, when you look up vacuum chambers, you're either going to have the option of an acrylic lid or a tempered glass lid. You need to make sure it has a tempered glass lid. I've seen so many reviews of people bad mouthing vacuum chambers or talking about how they had these failures and it's because they had the wrong lid on it. The stabilizing resin will actually it can corrode that acrylic lid. If you want to stabilize, it has to be tempered glass. If you're just gonna be doing degassing silicone and, and resins, the acrylic lid is fine. People will see the a super cheap vacuum chamber, they won't read the product description, which you have to do, and they will tell you if it can stabilize or not. I'll type in vacuum chamber, tempered glass lid and it'll give you everything that can stabilize resin with it. Sorry, it, it just kind of chaps my ass that people aren't doing the research, huh? Nice. Being the weirdo that I am, I want to stabilize other shit other than wood, like cereal. 
I bought the cheap cereal because it saves more money for the uh, silicones and resins. So I take the these generic Fruit Loops and I submerge them in the stabilizing resin and then I throw them into the vacuum chamber and then into the oven and it works. But the problem is, is that it leached the color out of them. We went ahead and did a test to see how it would work with the resin. We did a, uh, a control, which was this one. It was, this was not stabilized. You can see the colors are still kind of vibrant. This one was stabilized, but the colors were leached out of it. But they stayed in the resin with very minimal bubbles and the stabilizing helped to do that when this one the control actually floated to the top I don't know if you can see the bubbles because that's from the air that's within the uh, within the, the cereal it was back to the drawing board With the second attempt, I basically did all the same things. When I put it into the oven, I actually turned the temperature down a little bit and didn't keep it in as long. The first time I left it in for like 30 minutes. The second time I left it in the oven for, I think about 15 minutes. It was the baking process that was really taking out the color. So with cactus juice, you can actually add a dye into it. Basically separated the, the Fruit Loops and I took the individual colors and added alcohol dyes and did six different colors. That way it could really saturate the, the cereal. And then when I baked it and it started kind of taking some of the color, it would kind of bring it back to where it should be. And it actually worked. Adding extra dye, which made them super vibrant. But once they went into the oven, which I only left in for about 10 minutes or so, it actually brought it back to where it, they looked just like they came out of the box. Nice. Now that everything's been stabilized, it's time to go in the pressure pot. I make a blank with, I uh, got this little PVC tube and then this little, yeah, I've used this thing for uh, about two years and I just end up hot gluing shit to it. Throw the cereal in it, throw the resin into it, and throw it in the pressure pot. And like I said earlier, what the pressure pot does is it basically compresses all of those air bubbles to make them invisible to the naked eye. A side note is that handle, that blank, it has bubbles down at the end of the green. Well, I didn't realize that if you stabilize something, you need to either seal it up until you're ready to use it or use it immediately because I'd stabilized those green pieces several days before and moisture was able to get back into them. So I was actually able to use that blank and I made this out of it. That's a, a Delrin rod. And then I turned that handle down. So I was able to salvage it and then I just made another blank and that's the one that's gonna end up being the flogger. To show you what would happen if I didn't pressurize it, this is stabilized cereal, and that's what I'd shown you earlier. With the resin that I'm using, had I not used the pressure pot, this would have been the end result, and that just looks like shit. And then it's on to turning the handle. <laughs> Oh yeah, because I'm making a flogger, if you didn't get that from the intro, which, if yeah, if you've made it this far, now we're starting to get into the meat and potatoes, and the silicone, no, oh. weird little spoiler I gave, anyways, just, we'll get there shortly. Nice. As I just said, with the, uh, the silicone, I guess we're getting into the silicone conversation now. With the silicone, you primarily have two different forms of silicone. You have a tin cure and a platinum cure. And the platinum cure is the body safe one that a lot of the uh, people who make dildos, they use that material, uh, prosthetics, special effects makeup, 
are done with a platinum cured silicone. So I wanted to make the falls of this out of silicone. And the thing is, is platinum cured silicone, most of it you need a vacuum chamber so you can degas it. Nice. I need to make a sheet of silicone. So I got this white tray, I guess, I don't know if it's like a busing tray or whatever. That's what I'm gonna to use to build my mold for the falls. So I'm also taking some like corrugated plastic and I'm building the wall for it. And then we're going to mix up a platinum cured silicone called Dragon Skin and throw it in the vacuum chamber and then we'll pour it into our makeshift mold. Now, Miss Penguin had to step in because she's a little better at uh, kind of spreading it out to make it <laughs> work a little bit better. She said it was like, if you're making brownies and you put them in the pan and then you kind of have to smooth it out. Once it cures, I pull the silicone mat out because it's not a silicone mat and I trim off the edges and make it square. And then I cut it into falls and a flogger is born. Nice. So that brings us to uh, the end of this little journey. There's been a lot of learning curves on this for me, but it's all good. And this. This thing is super thuddy, but slappy also. So says Miss Penguin. Another learning curve is the, uh, the fact these were supposed to be red. And when you do resin and you use micas, you only have to use a little bit to get a pretty good effect out of it. I didn't realize you have to use a lot more mica and silicones to get the desired effect. But, now I know. It's also a little, whatever. But we also did another one just to uh, kind of play around with it. This, I just kind of mocked it up with a, a handle that I fucked up a long time ago. Look at that. This is the kind of stuff we're going to be getting into. Silicone falls, silicone floggers. I'm actually in the process of making a mold of a handle so we can... I want to have an entire flogger out of silicone. You can play with it and you can do that with it. And then once you're done, you can just throw it in the dishwasher to clean it. Yeah, so that's all fine and dandies. And if you go ahead and do all the, the shit to all the other shit, link in the description, you'll be able to follow on the journey with us. So thank you for sticking around this long. And until next time, 